long live the small firm. It's an exhortation, if you like. The strategies for sustaining business gives you a hint to the approach that I will be taking. And for the moment, I'll just concentrate on the sustainability uh, dimension. Uh, if you remain in business, you have to be aware of control of costs. So businesses in competitive settings need to look at energy costs, they need to look at water resources, they need to look at transport, they need to look at the use of digital means rather than paper-based means of communication. And in that way, the sustainability agenda is embedded in what they do. I'm not be expanding upon that, but there's a kind of consistency over all the three things that we're doing. Uh, another point that I should make is that uh, we, in pursuing the research we're presenting to you today, uh, do on the basis of teams that we've organized and sponsors who have been able to support our research. An outline, that's what I'm going to be doing this evening. I'm going to be talking about five things rather briefly. First of all, what's the probability of staying in business over the short term? Secondly, I'm looking at capital structure, particularly debt and equity, and I'm asking what is the best trajectory of that over time. I'm going to make a methodological point. There's a difference between a snapshot of a business and an evolutionary look at a business. And then I'm going to be asking some questions, particularly in the high-tech context, about what's the best optimal scale. We're here for simplicity. I'll be focusing on the headcount within the firm. And then finally, which is the basis of my most recent research, I'm looking at strategy and performance, and then particularly I'm looking at feedback effects. So it's certainly th true that a good strategy should lead to good performance, but that, does that feedback? And the answer is yes, but the modeling involved in doing that is relatively complex. This is a joke. <laughs> I think it's a good one. On the whiteboard are all these things, and uh, I think our own strategy groups do this. Uh, the wish list of things that we want to do uh, as a great institution, and firms do exactly the same thing. How do we do it? And there's a, a long wish list of varieties of forms of excellence there, uh, but uh, the business cycle is against you, and they, they've been scratching their heads, and finally they're saying, well, look, let's just survive the recession. Uh, and that does simplify the mission statement, but more than that, it says something about economic theory as well, and about the applied economics of a business, because in a sense, the fact that you do survive means you must tick the box in all these other categories, because that's what leads to success. I'm going to be looking at uh, two samples tonight. One is a sample of 150 Scottish small firms, micro firms typically, less than 10 employees. A fieldwork study that involved going out uh, throughout Scotland and uh, investigating key aspects of how the firm functions, their markets, their pricing, their employment, their innovation, and so on. That's a picture of uh, one of these samples. And we've got uh, down here, down uh, Fries and Galloway in Ayrshire, going up into Glasgow, and up through Stirling, across the central belt, lots of little places that nobody knows about, like Adiwell and so on, and down here, places that are quite disadvantaged by Hamilton, are in there as well as the great uh, powerhouses of Glasgow and Edinburgh, out to East Lothian, and then up into Stirlingshire, to Fife, to Dundee, and beyond and up to Aberdeen, and then finally out, where I think at the top there, the most remote firm there, was in, in Varuri. So this is a methodology that I use, and it's one of the business school that as a whole adopts, what we call the mixed or the multi-method, which both goes out into the field and looks at firms in a qualitative sense, and engages in quantitative modeling uh, and uh, computer uh, constructs to help you analyze the firm. Uh, the first technical point I want to look at is what is the probability of survival over a short period of time. There's a technique known as probit analysis that allows you to do that. There are two uh, critical uh, determinants of the probability of survival that can be broadly grouped into markets and uh, finance. And within markets, the thing that is most important is the product range. And within finance, the thing that is most important is gearing. And by gearing, we mean the ratio of debt to equity. The debt is typically a business loan, 
the equity is typically the owner manager's personal financial injection at startup of the firm. And indeed, we can then ask the question, is there an optimal or best gear in your product range? And the answer is yes. We can determine the probability maximizing for survival uh, values of these. And in the case we've identified here, the optimal gearing appears to be in a snapshot picture, 0.8, and the optimal product range appears to be around 6. So that's the kind of reasoning that we adopt. What determines something? Are they statistically significant? Do they have a leverage over outcomes, like probability of survival? And then can we, in certain circumstances, talk about optimality? And that's what I want to look at now. And I'm going to do this fairly briefly, but behind it is a quite advanced uh, body of mathematical reasoning. It uses a technique known as the Pontryagin Maximum Principle, and that was the same technique that, sent, that spat up the, the, the satellites uh, around uh, the Earth and then finally uh, spaceships out to the moon and beyond. It's the same kind of optimality mathematics, and I'm giving really only a hint of that. We're looking at a profit-maximizing firm, a firm that optimizes in all markets. It does the best it can in the, good, in the goods market. It does the best it can in the hiring market for factors of production, other than human factors of production. And uh, it does the best in terms of uh, its access to finance. But we're looking at optimality, and the focus I'm going to have here is on optimality in terms of gearing. Uh, this is one picture that I want to uh, commend to you. On the horizontal axis, we have time. On the vertical axis, we have a variety of key variables like output capital, debt, and dividend. And what we see here when we look at debt in particular, let's suppose to begin with that the, the owner manager's per, uh, financial injection of fund is taken as given. Uh, so the equity is taken as given. What we've got here is a picture that seems different to the static snapshot picture of an optimal gearing of point A. What's actually happening here given uh, the amount of equity, is that the debt is actually rising, and so the gearing is going up. And the gearing is going up, uh, and therefore probably increasing risk. But that may be a good thing to do, because you want to get a toehold in the market, and you're willing to pay the price of doing that. I mentioned price here, and that particular uh, uh, diagram there depends upon debt being cheap. So there are other considerations. I want to go away from the idea of a unique or best point, and to think rather there is a path or a trajectory here, and that trajectory itself is dependent upon other things. And in the simplest scenario we're looking at, it depends on the relative price of debt and equity. So there are broadly two scenarios here. One sustains debt, and the other one retires debt. And this is the case in which we have debt retire. We now have equities relatively cheap, debt is relatively expensive, therefore, and we have a period, as in the previous diagram, when equity was relatively more expensive, where you're growing the debt, but because equity is relatively cheap, you're retiring the debt over a consolidation period. So in other words, there isn't an ideal or best uh, equity or debt structure. It depends at a particular point in time. If you want to get a market, you might be willing to pay the price of acquiring a lot of debt. Once you have the toehold, you might want to retire that debt rapidly, but it's perfectly possible to reach later stages where you again require a debt, acquire debt as you restructure. What about size? Can we think of optimality in size as well? Well, all small firms uh, tend to have growth ambitions, but we're going to ask the question, what's the best size uh, and how can we get to it? And I want to do this particularly in the context of high technology firms because they often show promise of very large growth. I'm going to look at a sample that I undertook with uh, London Our Usual, an academic at uh, Spru in the University of Sussex. We looked at about 840 Scottish high-tech firms in the immediate term, the short term, and the long term. And we were very interested in their innovation in sector intensity and how it varied by size. Now that is a picture that is indicative of what we've done. On the vertical axis, we have innovation intensity. On the horizontal axis, we have size. And here we have this uh, average relationship, this calibration over the whole sample of 840 firms 
of what the typical relationship between uh, size and innovative uh, capacity is. And what we find is, to begin with, there is a short period equilibrium round about there, and it's roughly a headcount of 100 employees, and that little uh, umbrella shape there shows you what your innovative capacity is with given plant and equipment. If you can vary your plant and equipment, you create this so-called envelope of possible relations of innovation to size. And around here you have uh, 1,000 employees at the maximum intensity. And then finally, if you try and push on the size, what you find is it's quite difficult to keep the same level of innovation intensity. Uh, to uh, go beyond that, and that SW uh, double star is about 3,000 uh, on the headcount, you get into what is called the Schumpeterian range after <coughs> Joseph Schumpeter, a Harvard uh, economist, who uh, talked about the possibilities of indefinitely increasing returns to scale when you're engaging in uh, high-scale manufacturers. And then my final theme is to look at uh, current work which I'm undertaking with Bernard at Power uh, of University College Cork on performance, size and competitive strategy. It's a very technical paper that's recently come out, but I can summarise it in a few simple equations. There is a, a relationship here between performance P and size uh, S and another variable here which is uh, a competitive strategy variable. It's a measure of the diversity, in fact, of competitive strategy. And we're saying that S size uh, determines performance in this function F, in this function G, I'll call this techno speak. We have performance determining size. And then finally, we have a third equation in the model we, where we have P performance determining competitive strategy. For those who've done uh, higher uh, uh, mathematics, in the Scottish syllabus, that's a simultaneous equation with three equations in it. It can be a much more complicated system than that, but you can strip it down in that way. And all it's really saying, using a bit of mathematics, is that there is a mutual interdependence between the three key variables, performance, size, and competitive strategy. It's possible to model that empirically using econometric methods. This is the only technical part of the talk, but I felt it irresistible when I put this in. It shows you in some sense what we do, and it's part of an article that recently came out a couple of months ago. And then it shows two very important trade-off relationships. This S uh, function here is a relationship uh, between uh, performance and size, and that will call the one with the black squares. And there's another one here, the converse of the relationship, the relationship between uh, size and performance. And this is contingent of on the competitive strategy. And what we've got here is, in fact, an equilibrium size of firm, credible for the sort of sample we're dealing with, of a headcount of roughly 14, with on an index that goes from 1 to 100, a performance level of about two-thirds of about 67%. <coughs> and the question we're asking is, what will happen if we vary our uh, competitive strategy? If we make it more diverse, it will in fact shift that function up. And the equilibrium will shift from here to this point E star. And in doing so, the equilibrium size uh, is reduced roughly by half, but the performance level goes up from uh, about two-thirds to nearly three-quarters. <coughs> There's another uh, relationship that we could consider to be shifting, but I don't want to steal, steal the thunder of Reza Kui's uh, talk that follows on, we could then say, well, can't we shift the function here, which has the black uh, uh, squares of it? The answer is yes, we could shift that up, and to the extent that we could shift that up, we will get both an increase in size and an increase in performance. And how that's done is something that I leave to my distinguished colleague. There are a couple of case studies here I want to illustrate with. One is a bulk bag production uh, firm that uh, originally was in the duty industry. It wasn't competitive, so it downsized its manufacture, it outsourced from Asia, it shed some employees, and now is very competitive in the global marketplace once again. The other is an Edinburgh firm uh, out near Kennecook, uh, a light manufacturer of uh, plastic injection moldings. It too uh, downsized. It became a low-cost leader. 
it engaged in a lot of uh, capital investment that raised the marginal productivity of capital, but also the labor that was employed with it, and makes that again one of these very successful transnational enterprises. So the gap in what I'm speaking about feeds onto Professor Curie's uh, talk. The gap is to consider what happens if you have a highly skilled and flexible labor force that can be used to assist the longevity of a firm. It can mitigate the trend to, uh, for small firms to remain small, but it requires quite a lot of work and technical accomplishment to move it. Strategic alliances, shared facilities, franchising, and so on are amongst the things that you can use to make labor work more effectively and indeed then to get growth in the headcount along with growth in size. So let me conclude. First of all, I've really expanded a kind of uh, method. We call it the VIX method or the multi-method. It's a mixture of qualitative and quantitative work. So there's quantitative modeling on the computer on the one hand, and there's going out into businesses in the field, meeting with entrepreneurs, and in, uh, engaging in dialogues with them, and gathering data in that way. It allows you this type of uh, method to uh, to consider determinants of survival, to make recommendations on best capital structure, to see what is the optimal scale over the various time periods, and to see what the impacts of new strategies and innovative uh, trends uh, are going to be on your performance. The sustaining of a uh, small business in the long term depends essentially on control of the wage bill. That's a key, as we say, cost driver. But introduced for the first time tonight to many of you, this idea of the diversity of business strategy, and that really, it turns out, is pretty important. And also, as we shall see in the talk to follow by Reza Kui, uh, the investment in the workforce. And finally, these are a number of uh, uh, studies here. One is a book that writes up all of this in a very uh, lengthy uh, version. Uh, uh, another is uh, the work with Vandenar Usual down in Spru uh, on high-tech firms and optimal size. And the final one is the Bernadette Power of UCC, something that recently came out, a fairly technical piece that I hope I've managed to simplify in sufficient degree to enable you to be comfortable with my exposition tonight. Thank you very much.